Tonight, the unexpected confession of a serial killer. Disturbing details from the man who killed four indigenous women, what he said during a police interrogation and what it means for his trial. What CBC News has learned about Drake's security a day after a shooting outside his Toronto mansion. Everyone knows where he sleeps, where he eats, and that has really freaked him out. And London drugs on surviving the cyber attack that closed its stores. It's because of those amazing employees. I'm sorry if I get a little emotional. They've just been amazing. An exclusive interview in The Breakdown. From CBC News, this is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for joining us. The interrogation and confession of a Winnipeg serial killer are now public, providing new insight into his horrifying actions. We now know, while being questioned in the death of one woman, Jeremy Skabicki unexpectedly confessed to killing four Indigenous women, one who is still unidentified. Skabicki's lawyers aren't denying the killings, instead arguing he is not criminally responsible. Again, the details from court today are disturbing, and you're about to hear some of them. But as Cam McIntosh shows us, those details are critical to the case. Family and friends of four murdered Indigenous women bracing themselves for difficult details. The first day of trial. Jeremy Skabicki is charged with four counts of first-degree murder in the killings of Rebecca Contois, Mercedes Myron, Morgan Harris, and an unidentified woman given the name Mushkode Bishike Ikwe Iban, or Buffalo Woman, who police say wore this jacket. Skabicki's lawyers say he admits to killing the women, but are arguing he's not criminally responsible due to a mental disorder. Just wait for the trial to unfold, and then you'll get all the information there. In court, the Crown laid out the disturbing details of its case, alleging Skabicki targeted Indigenous women outside Winnipeg homeless shelters, taking them to his apartment, sexually assaulting, killing them, continuing to perform sexual acts on their bodies, then throwing their remains in the garbage. This case is about a man's hate-filled and cruel acts perpetrated against four vulnerable Indigenous women, said Crown René Lajamodier. Court first heard a 911 call from a man who found Contois' partial remains in a garbage bin outside Skabicki's apartment. Unknown. I don't know how this woman, well, she obviously was murdered. It doesn't appear, right? So, okay, you know. Court also heard those remains led police to Skabicki, who, in a videotaped interrogation played in court, surprised police, admitting to killing Contois and three other women. I just wanted to see how far I could take things. The criminal justice system is a joke. I killed four people, he said. I really tried not to prolong their suffering. DNA of Contois, Myron and Harris were found in Skabicki's apartment. Remains of Contois were also found in Winnipeg's Brady Landfill. Police say remains of Myron and Harris are in another landfill north of Winnipeg. There have been angry demands from families and Indigenous leaders for more than a year for a search. The federal and provincial governments say they'll fund one after the trial. In the interrogation video, Skabicki told police he brought other women home, but didn't kill them if they logged onto Facebook. He also says he let one woman go after noticing she was wearing a rosary. So, Cam, you mentioned that families were in court. It, it was clearly a really tough day for them. Well, Adrian, many of them were visibly disturbed, distraught. Some of them didn't stay in the room for the most graphic details. Keep in mind, it's taken a lot for a lot of these people to get this far, just knowing what happened to their loved ones' remains. Now to have it all spelled out in court with the accused in the room, that's something different. And Adrian, this trial is expected to go another four weeks. Well, all right, Cam McIntosh reporting in Winnipeg. Thank you. U.S. President Joe Biden is sending a public warning to Israel using some of his strongest language yet. Invade Rafa, and there will be consequences. If they go into Rafa, they haven't gone into Rafa yet. If they go into Rafa, I'm not supplying the weapons that have been used historically to deal with Rafa. It's, it's just wrong. Biden made those comments tonight during an interview with CNN. It comes after similar messages from top U.S. officials, a new level of pressure on Israel to avoid a full-scale invasion of Rafah. But Israel is carrying out what it calls a pinpoint operation in Rafah. Chris Brown is in Jerusalem again for us tonight. 
In the face of near unanimous global opposition to a ground offensive into Rafa, Israel's military pursued its attacks. Its officials say this is a calibrated, limited incursion aimed at exerting pressure on Hamas. <laughs> but on the ground, these scenes, shot by a freelance videographer working for CBC News, suggest civilians are among the dead. In the whole area, there are only civilians, there are no militants, said Reda al Najili, who witnessed the attack. For the first time, a senior U.S. official acknowledged publicly that the U.S. has withheld a shipment of ammunition to Israel to send a message not to go any further. Israel shouldn't launch a, a major attack in Arafa without accounting for uh, and protecting the civilians that are in that battle space. Privately, Israeli officials are said to be furious over the U.S. move, but publicly, they've tried to downplay the significance of it. All of this comes against the backdrop of ongoing negotiations with Hamas. Monday, the militant group said it accepted a ceasefire proposal, but Israel said Hamas changed the terms of the agreement. In Gaza, there's fear the talks will fail again. We spoke to Canadian Nika Alexander, who's in Rafa with the World Health Organization. As we drove through the streets yesterday and today, you could see people have piled up everything they own onto donkey carts, crammed into cars, many people together in a bus, just trying to get to some place that maybe will feel safer. But we do feel that nowhere is completely safe, so that's really stressful. While aid trucks, which had been unable to enter Gaza for several days, began moving again, Alexander says the flow of medical supplies and fuel for generators has reduced to a trickle, adding to a sense of impending doom. You just can't imagine how many people might die if there's a great escalation in the, in the fighting in this area. Hamas is demanding a guarantee that the war will end if it frees the hostages. But Israel says it will only consider a temporary pause as many members of its coalition government are adamant that the fight against Hamas must continue. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. A pro-Palestinian protest encampment at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. is one of the latest to be cleared by police. I can't stop. Police confirmed they used pepper spray against some protesters and made more than 30 arrests. The move to disperse the camp came ahead of the D.C. mayor's expected appearance before a U.S. congressional committee to face questions about the city's relatively gentle approach to the protests. Citing this morning's crackdown, the Republican-led committee canceled the hearing. A Boeing aircraft is at the center of another frightening incident. This one, this 767 cargo plane was forced to land right there in Istanbul without its front landing gear deployed. Pilots informed air traffic control about the gear's failure just before the plane skidded onto the runway. No injuries were reported. So far, no comment on this from Boeing. CBC News has learned new details about the security at Drake's home in Toronto. This after a guard was shot outside the rap star's mansion on Tuesday. Thomas Dagna with what we know about the firm in charge of protecting the property. Leather glove, no sequence. In a music video four years ago, I could dance like Michael Jack. Drake showed off the lavish interior of his Toronto mansion. He never hid the address, even putting that nickname, the embassy, on full display outside. But at a public council meeting in 2019, an architecture firm hired by the rap star revealed Drake's security nightmare. Everyone yes. knows where he sleeps, where he eats, and, and that has really freaked him out, us out, and we need heavy security outside. At that meeting, the city granted Drake permission to build extra tall fencing around his property. And this week, it was just outside that police say a suspect drove up and shot a security guard. He was standing outside of the gates in front of the residence when the shooting occurred. CBC News has learned more about the security firm operating here outside the house. Have a look at that vehicle. Jungle Lion Security presents itself as Canada's number one provider of security services. But no one answered our repeated calls, and the firm doesn't appear to have a website. We obtained Ontario Transportation Ministry records showing the license plate on the company's vehicle is registered to Aubrey D. Graham, better known as Drake. 
and the only person listed in the security firm's public profile is the man seen next to Drake in this video, his reported head of security, known to fans as Chubbs. People that are in the rapper world, they are the most uh, highest threat level of any, any people in the in entertainment industry. The Canadian star's feud with fellow rapper Kendrick Lamar has only raised the stakes. He always said I overlooked him, I was staring straight. With the pair trading escalating insults and threats. Psst, I see dead people. In a flood of new songs devoured by fans. Police are aware of the beef, but say they don't know the attacker's motive yet. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Police across Ontario have charged 64 people after an intensive province-wide child sexual abuse investigation. All of the accused were arrested within the span of just 10 days. Idil Musa now on how police caught their suspects and the growing threat that's emerging. Police in Ontario say a fast-paced operation into online child sexual exploitation and abuse has led to hundreds of charges. Project Aquatic was an opportunity for officers from 27 police services to come together and to identify and stop the abuse of 34 child victims. Spanning 10 days in February, Project Aquatic resulted in the arrest of 64 people who are facing 348 charges. Police also seized 607 electronic devices. But deciphering all that data wasn't easy, they say. Technology is evolving at a rate that legislation is unable to keep up with, and not to mention the amount of time required to go through terabytes of information. Complicating things even further is the use of artificial intelligence to create or manipulate existing child sexual abuse materials. AI-generated images have tipped the scale on an already epidemic-sized issue. Police say most of these arrests resulted from complaints relayed to them from social media companies. Still, Arneson says those companies need to do more to keep children and youth safe on their platforms, and so do parents. They can't bury their heads in the sand until such time as uh, these platforms are safer to be, for children to be on. You need to be vigilant and you have to have the hard conversations. This sexual exploitation expert agrees. It can be something as easy as discussing what is the internet, um, who's on there, what kind of people are on there. Sharifi says it's critical for children and youth to understand how exploitation online happens so they can keep themselves safe from potential predators. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. There are new promises tonight to tackle a problem we've been reporting on for months now, e-transfers that are used to send abusive messages. Katie Nicholson now with the growing calls for action and the new response. Dear TD, Scotiabank. Rhiannon Wong reads from the open letter sent to the CEOs of Canada's major banks demanding they crack down on abusive e-transfers. Angie Sweeney's murder underscores the urgent... Like the ones Angie Sweeney's ex sent her hours before he killed her in October. Wong's organization is frustrated banks don't appear to be taking action. Silence is very telling. It's either the banks have decided that if they are quiet about the issue, that the issue will just go away, or they've decided that is perfectly acceptable. The letter wants Canadian banks to adopt the free AI software developed by an Australian bank that blocks abusive language, or swipe up from the app home screen to pull up the transaction feed. This program, introduced last year by a UK bank, which allows clients to block messages from abusers. Tap on the payment you've received with an unwanted reference. One common form we hear often is that abusive partners open up credit cards in the victim's name, even without their knowledge, and accumulate debt. The Canadian Centre for Women's Empowerment co-authored the letter. It just released a report outlining a dozen recommendations to banks to better protect survivors. Their products, their financial products and services are not only in a few cases, but systematically being exploited by abusive partners to control and abuse victims. In response to the letter, the Canadian Bankers Association says its members are now reviewing technology that could be used to combat this type of financial abuse. And Interact says it's assembled a team to develop a reporting mechanism for messages that could be abusive. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. 
At least 100 people are now confirmed dead in Brazil, where heavy rain has led to some devastating floods. Rescue crews are navigating the roads of Porto Alegre by boat, searching for stranded residents and animals. Well over 200,000 people have been displaced, some now living on overpasses and at the city's airport. Planes were nearly underwater, along with dozens of vehicles that are completely submerged. This as four more days of heavy rain are in the forecast beginning on Friday. And that's terrifying. A Michigan homeowner caught this sight on its doorbell camera as a fierce tornado swept in. Severe storms hit the state last night, prompting a state of emergency in several counties. Many buildings were destroyed, but no fatalities have been reported. Several unions representing tens of thousands of federal workers are promising a fight after the government said it was mandating civil servants return to the office three days a week. Kate McKenna now with the blowback. The head of one of Canada's largest public sector unions coming out with fighting words. The Liberal government's move to force federal workers back into ill-equipped and poorly maintained offices three days a week is purely political. Public sector unions have legal challenges against the government and say more are coming, encouraging members to file individual grievances to force the government to withdraw their mandate. This over a plan to force public servants back to the office for three days a week starting in September. Unions say they were blindsided. We fought and won a commitment from this government that would protect public service workers from arbitrary government-wide decisions on telework just like this one. Last year, public servants were ordered to come back two days a week after being sent home during the pandemic. The Treasury Board says hybrid work isn't a bargaining chip and wasn't part of signed agreements. The most important thing is to continue to deliver services for Canadians and to protect taxpayer dollars. The government could have handled this better, says this expert. If I was the union, quite honestly, the government has done it wrong by actually, by fiat saying, this is it, three days, with no real logic behind that. On the streets, opinion is split. It's hard to say. I don't think that people are any less productive working from home. I, I don't really think our tax dollars should be paying for office space. It's unnecessary. People have to remember that you used to work full time, right? Five days a week or some people seven. So. I think a compromise for three days shouldn't be a big issue. I do think it's important to have time in the office. Um, there's a lot to be said for the interaction with people. But the unions say they're not backing down, promising a summer of discontent unless the government relents. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. Prince Harry makes a rare appearance back in London. Why he returned home but won't be seeing the king. Health Canada changes the rules for who can and cannot donate sperm. It reduces the stigma that has been present for many years. Why some say it makes little difference. Nay, can you say mum? And a child smile at the sound of his mom. He was probably like, oh, yes, I can hear again. You know, that's mum. <laughs> We're back in two. That's a pretty warm welcome from Prince Harry outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He's back in the UK to mark the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Games, but he will not be seeing his father, King Charles, during this trip. A spokesman for the Duke of Sussex said it was due to the monarch's, quote, full program. Yeah, I guess it does say something, but I guess we don't know what that means. When you're recovering from a disease, yeah. you want your family close, but still, yeah, a lot has happened. And not too far away at Buckingham Palace, Charles, who is still undergoing cancer treatment, welcomed guests for an annual garden party. The palace offered no comment on Harry's visit. Well, here in this country, new rules mean more men who have sex with men can now donate to sperm banks. The change comes after decades of restrictions. But as Tashana Reed tells us, some say it does not go far enough. At this fertility clinic lies hope for people wanting to start a family. 
most of the sperm here comes from the U.S., but that could change after Health Canada revised its policy. It increases the pool of potential sperm donors in Canada for our patients. For decades, there was a total ban on gay and bisexual men from donating to sperm banks. In 2020, restrictions eased, barring men who had sex with men within the past three months. Now, egg and sperm donors will have to meet gender-neutral screening criteria, like this one. A person who has had anal sex with a new sexual partner in the preceding three months would not qualify. The change follows an end to the ban on blood donations from men who have sex with men. It reduces the stigma that has been present for many years against gay and bisexual men being able to participate in this process. The stigma is like... But some argue the new screening criteria like still excludes. It opened up to a few more people, but um, the discrimination is, is still there. I donated for Aziz M, whose full name is protected under a court order, filed a case in 2023 against the federal government over its donor policy. He says the changes are a step in the right direction, it doesn't go far enough. The questions will continue to exclude uh, gay and bisexual men who engage in anal sex. Health Canada says its revision is based on scientific evidence, including the association between HIV and certain high-risk behaviors. Receptive anal intercourse particularly has been uh, identified as a risk factor for transmission of many sexually transmitted infections. Still, experts say rigorous safety protocols ensure donor samples are safe. Every single sample will be quarantined and stored for six months in liquid nitrogen. And this donor has to come back in three months to be retested. We're moving in the right direction. As for Aziz, he plans to continue his legal fight to ensure more people can help others start a family. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. After more than a week of disruptions, the president of London Drug says the company is still investigating the cyber attack. Can you guarantee to us that this isn't going to happen again? We have done everything humanly possible. Ian's exclusive television interview on what happened and how it's affecting the company. Sorry if I get a little emotional. <laughs> They've just been amazing. But first, heavy sanctions have done little to stop Russia's attack on Ukraine. We stand prepared to go further as with sanctions. So how is Vladimir Putin fueling the war? Well, Peter Armstrong and Briar Stewart will join me to make sense of it next. The Olympic flame landed on French soil with great fanfare. It sailed in on a historic tall ship after a 12-day trip from Greece. Two French Olympians brought the torch onto land, passing it to Marseille-born rapper Jules to light the cauldron. French President Emmanuel Macron told journalists, today the country's security forces are ready to face the huge security issue of hosting the Olympic Games. And the former interpreter for baseball superstar Shohei Otani is now expected to plead guilty to bank and tax fraud in a major sports betting case. Ipe Mizuhara is accused of stealing $17 million from Otani to pay off his own gambling debts. Officials say there's no evidence the L.A. Dodgers player was involved in or aware of the gambling. Mizuhara now faces up to 33 years in prison. Well, tonight, the battle begins for Canadian supremacy on the ice. The Vancouver Canucks host the Edmonton Oilers in game one of the second round of the playoffs. The series winner will be the only Canadian team still vying for the season's Stanley Cup. Lindsay Duncombe looks at a unique rivalry. How chippy is the banter between Canucks and Oilers fans ahead of game one? Well, when interviewing fans, expect interruptions. How far do you think the Canucks are going to go? Or nothing Oilers. <laughs> <laughs> These twin sisters support opposite teams. Huge rivalry, so we'll be going at it. <laughs> there hasn't been a Canucks Oilers playoff series since 1992. But now, says the host of Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi, the elements of a dramatic matchup. The Oilers favorites playing hot with the best player in the league and a new coach. The Canucks dominant in the regular season, now underdogs. Their superstar goalie injured. Fans are worked up. It's like a family reunion, but you haven't seen your cousin in 30 years. Oh, in theory, this should be fun. But in actuality, it's gotten pretty nasty on social media. This Penticton Boston pizza was razzed when it chose a side. Yeah, that's Go Oilers at a BC restaurant. You know, most of my friends are cheering for the other team. 
and they give me a lot of flack. Deep in Canuck territory, Justin Cathcart's basement is an Euler enclave. He's been a fan so long, he has ticket stubs from when games were affordable. 1986 uh, Vancouver versus Edmonton. And $12.80. $12.80. yes. To him, the trash talk is all in good fun. I love the fan base. I love to see them get excited. Just stop burning stuff down. Leave the stores alone. Please, please. Okay, so that is a dig about Vancouver's 2011 post-Game 7 riot. In fact, the city is so worried about a possible repeat, it's held off on public outdoor viewing parties until this coming weekend for Game 3, when people can gather at a family-friendly park far away from downtown bars. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. How London drugs got through the cyber attack that shut down 79 stores in Western Canada. It's because of those amazing employees and sorry if I get a little emotional, they've just been amazing. But first, remember when the war in Ukraine started all those threats from countries in the West to sanction Russia into submission? Here's a reminder of what they said. Today, Canada is announcing new sanctions. And will continue to escalate sanctions if Russia escalates. To hobble the Russian economy. Punishing Putin and his enablers where it hurts most. So since Russia invaded Ukraine, a whole bunch of countries have imposed sanctions to crack down on Russia's ability to bring in money. Cracking down on oil, a huge part of that. But here's the thing. Russia is still making money, enough money to fund the war, and it turns out the world's markets might just be enabling that war. So let's break it down. CBC's business correspondent Peter Armstrong is here, as is CBC's Briar Stewart in London. Briar, of course, was our Russia correspondent until Russia kicked CBC out, so thanks for being with us. Here's a clue to how all this works. This right here is the Andromeda Star. It's a ship that carries crude oil from Russia. Now, if we look over here at the GPS tracking, all these colored marks, these are ships. Right here is the Andromeda Star. It is docked in India. So India is getting Russian oil. Peter, why is anyone getting oil from Russia? Yeah, look, it, it's important to sort of remember where we're at here, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the taps to Russian energy were never turned completely off. The West tried to strike this kind of weird compromise. They worried that a, a full-blown embargo of Russian energy products would simply drive up prices way too high. So what they did instead was they set this price cap, and they were hoping that that would let some oil flow, but make it so Russia couldn't really make any money. It was, at best, a flawed theory. It was definitely a thing the Russians could exploit. And what we're seeing there, Adrian, is that Russia is exploiting it. Russia's pulling in anywhere between half a billion and a billion dollars every single day, selling oil largely, as you say, to India and China. So if I pull back, the idea was, right, that the price cap would mean Russia is losing money on its oil sales, losing enough that Russians felt it, like a, t a type of punishment. That was the intention. Yeah, the, the cap kind of meant that Russia could continue to sell oil. It could continue to use conventional shipping, get insurance for that, so long as it sold that oil for less than $60 a barrel, so essentially at a loss. But China and India were more than happy to gobble up oil at prices well below the international market level. But it also, it kind of opened the door to this pretty easy workaround to that price cap. That the Russians just bought up a bunch of old tankers, created what everyone's been calling this shadow fleet. That ship you mentioned, the Andromeda, that's just one example. And at first, they were really kind of clandestine about it, right? Secretive about how they were doing this. Bloomberg had this amazing piece where they found one registered ship pumping oil offshore onto another unregistered ship. But increasingly, Adrian, it's become pretty brazen, right? There are now hundreds of these vessels shipping oil, and all of that sells well above that $60 cap. One analyst I spoke with said, quote, they're rubbing it in our face and laughing at us. On that note, let's have a look at the graph here, because I think it, it, it sort of makes your point, Peter. Um, this shows Russia's oil shipments to Europe. As you can see, over time, once the war started, they declined a bit, right, since the war began. But if you have a look at another market over here, this is Russian oil shipments trade to Asia. 
Look at that. It's just been growing. Briar, you, you have been looking closely at, at, at numbers like this. You've been looking at what's been happening in Moscow. Based on what Peter is saying, what these numbers are telling us, it looks to me like the Russian economy is doing just fine despite the war. Well, that's it, Adrian. I mean, Russia's economy has adjusted and the population has adjusted too. I mean, certainly some prices have gone up for certain products. I mean, take Apple, for instance. It's no longer operating in Russia, but you can still get the iPhone. It's just more expensive now because it has to come into Russia via another country. But shelves are full, products are available, and I think that really goes a long way in influencing public sentiment. Because if people were having a hard time getting a hold of groceries or feeding their families, you could see how they could be more upset about the current political situation, but that's not the case. For the most part, Russians are managing. I mean, it is more difficult for a lot of them, certainly, to go on vacation in Europe, but for those who can afford to, they can still go to places like Egypt and Dubai where they're warmly welcomed. And the other thing that's interesting to point out is that wages in Russia are actually going up, and that's because there's a labor shortage. I mean, Russian factories are working 24-7, churning out military equipment. On top of that, you have hundreds of thousands of men who have been drafted into the army, so they're out of the labor market. Market. And this whole labor shortage is a real concern for Russian economists going forward. But right now, the Russian economy is on track to grow by about 3.2% this year, which is more than Canada and the rest of the G7. Well, that, that won't impress Joe Biden. Uh, you know, the, the energy caps that we've been talking about, they aren't the only sanctions that were put in place to try to curb Russia's access to cash and, and hinder its war machine. So, so what else is being done now? And I guess more importantly, what needs to be done still to, to try to slow Russia's cash flow? I think what we're starting to see is more of an effort to close these loopholes and workarounds that Russia has been using to not only fund the war, but secure the technology that it needs to produce weapons. And the U.S. really has stepped up pressure quite recently on countries like Turkey and China, which have really increased their trade with Russia. In fact, the U.S. Treasury has even introduced sanctions against Chinese companies, which it accuses of, of helping Russia produce drones. So that's one area. I mean, the other discussion, which can continues to go on is just what to do with the money owned by Russia's central bank that is currently frozen in offshore accounts. Now, this is about $300 billion U.S. What the, the United States wants to do is basically take that money and give it to Ukraine so it can use it to help defend itself. Europe is talking about more along the lines of taking the profits from that money. And this is an ongoing debate that's been going on for, for months. And, and I bring this up because I really think it highlights the fact that even among Ukraine's partners and allies, when there's a desire to take more measures, there's not always agreement. Right. So many loopholes Russia's finding. Peter, I suppose the bottom line here is, do sanctions even matter if Putin still has what he needs to fight this war? Adrian, if you kind of zoom out, there's a broader story here that begins to emerge. And, you know, you think about for, what, 80 years now, the Western bloc of countries, the international globalized trade bloc that emerged out of World War II. It was able to impose its weight on countries that they felt were breaking the rules. And, and slowly over the last 10 or 15 years, that system of globalization is coming apart. So in a lot of ways, this has been a test of that order. And so far, the test isn't going that well for the West. And if it fails outright, you have to wonder if it's going to be the last time those Western countries band together like this. And just on one last note, Breyer and I were just talking about the next big development in this is going to be a summit between the presidents of China and Russia. Be really interesting to see how they frame that meeting in light of the Western push to change the way Russia's behaving. And the war chugs on. All right, Peter Armstrong, Breyer Stewart, thank you both so much for being with us. You bet. Welcome. The president of London Drugs addresses the cyber attack that took out the retailer. As long as we give customers access, there's still an entry point. He tells Ian what they're doing to stop the threat next. Hackers did more than knock out London Drugs' website. The attack shut down all 79 stores. They told me that they were closed. That sent shockwaves from Manitoba to BC, where so many rely on the chain for the medications they need. I just can't imagine that it was happening. With stores now reopened, Ian spoke this morning with London Drugs' president and chief operating officer in a TV exclusive. Here's our conversation. 
Clint Mullman, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Ian. Uh, this was a long closure. I don't have to tell you a week or longer, depending on the store. And I know your store did say this was a cybersecurity attack, but not many more details. Why did you have to shut down for so long? Well, the safety and security for all our customers, our employees is paramount. We practice and have a lot of routines that go back decades of how we prepare to defend ourselves against cybersecurity attacks. And as part of our response plan is that when we see a, a active cybersecurity incident undergo, um, it's to shut down the systems company-wide immediately to make sure that we isolate so we can mitigate the attack and start to immediately re uh, remediate uh, what has gone on. And so it's, it's obviously an extremely big decision, but that's the level of care that we take for our customers and employees' data to do everything humanly possible to make sure it's protected. A lot of us really don't understand what cybersecurity attack means. Um, what can you tell us about what happened and who might be behind it? Yeah, the investigation's ongoing, uh, Ian, so I can't get into the details and, and we'll never be releasing a lot of the details. Um, obviously, when the attack happened, uh, part of our response plan is to bring in across North America the very leading experts in cybersecurity attacks. And one of the things that uh, they are able to share with us is that these attacks have very consistent patterns. They know that these very sophisticated uh, international entities um, have certain methods and behaviors. And one of those methods is they monitor media and they look at media, social media, customer speculation as forms of intelligence to further determine if they can attack us through different ways and uh, through different leverage points. And that is why, unfortunately, despite London Drug's historical effort of being very open and honest, and we've done as best we can, that's why there's certain things we just can't and won't say to give these uh, very sophisticated cyber entities uh, any leverage points as possible. What about the goal of this? Because presumably the bad actors know what their goal is, so we won't be um, you know, tipping them off. A lot of speculation online that it was ransomware. Um, was it that? Were they trying to get customer information? What was their goal? Uh, Ian, uh, the investigation's ongoing, and we really don't know why London Drugs. Uh, what we can tell you is, is that, as is well known, um, companies around the world are attacked every day. Um, you know, London Drugs, uh, for example, customers may find interesting that every day, for, for as long as I can remember, we get thousands of attempts of attack every day that we defend off. And that's just the nature of cyber activities out there today. So uh, the investigation's ongoing and that we will continue to, to work with whoever we have to to make sure that we continue the best of expertise that we open in a safe, secure and, uh, and methodical way. Uh, the news releases from your organization have said, I think uh, to the best of your knowledge, customer information has not been compromised. Um, are you 100% confident that that information is safe? Ian, the investigation's ongoing, and we're going through a massive amount of data. Um, and as of this moment, we have no evidence that a customer database has been compromised. But there's a lot of the investigation will go on for months. And our dedication is, is that should we find anything, of course, we will be uh, communicating with those individual customers. And we've already proactively reached out to the privacy commissioners to let them know what's going on. Um, and we'll be working in coordination with them as well, should we find anything. But at this moment, we have no indications of compromise of our customer database. You're a big chain. I think it's 79 stores in, in Western Canada. So that's a lot of employees. Were they, were they paid during this closure? Absolutely. You know, London Drugs culture has often been spoken about uh, throughout the retail industry and other businesses as being this legendary culture uh, with these incredibly motivated people. Uh, just this week alone, uh, we celebrated uh, our first 50-year employee, uh, 16 uh, 45-year employees, 17 40-year employees, uh, thousands of others with long sinks of services. And we wouldn't allow these threat actors to take away that celebration of these hardworking people. And to give you the extent of the culture, uh, we had retired employees that had a lot of IT knowledge of these old systems just show up and start to work. And it's because of those amazing employees, and sorry if I get a little emotional, <laughs> they've just been amazing. 
you're entitled to get emotional. I mean, it's been a very trying emotional time. Uh, I mean, you're a guy who's been at London Drugs from the time you, I think, were a clerk while you were going to university. Um, how, how have, how's the last week been for you, Clint? Well, you know, quite frankly, I'm like every, every other London Drugs person. Um, the absolute outpouring of love from the community is, is magnificent, unexpected. Um, it's been the oxygen of, that's motivated our people, inspired our people, made us incredibly emotional. But what it's done is it's, it's just got our employees through this incredibly difficult time uh, to get back. You know, we're a very proud, multi-generational, family-owned company based here with Western Canadian roots. And our love with to serving the communities cannot be expressed probably in the proper words. So our employees are just so dedicated to get back to taking care of those customers. So when we see that love that the customers have been showing, and it's just been overwhelming, it's, it's been incredible motivation, and that's what's keeping our employees and myself going at this point. But here's a difficult and, and, and challenging question, perhaps. Um, I'm a customer of your store, and like a lot of other people, I've got personal photos that are probably in your database. Uh, my information is there as a frequent customer, and that's multiplied by hundreds of thousands of people probably in Western Canada. Can you guarantee to us that this isn't going to happen again, that, that our information is going to be safe in the future? Ian, as I've described, London Drugs has employed the, the latest techniques with the best of expertise, externally audited routinely. We do all sorts of tests uh, to make sure that threat actors can't get in. And as we've seen, in even the most sophisticated organizations like governments uh, that have unlimited resources, massive corporations like some of the social media giants that have unlimited resources, even the bad actors have been able to penetrate those. So we have every uh, belief that we have done everything humanly possible and technically possible but still balancing customer access because as long as we give customers access there's still an entry point so you know I can never guarantee a hundred percent because no organization can ever reasonably guarantee a hundred percent with the level of sophistication and resources that these threat international threat actors are deploying but I'll guarantee you we'll do everything humanly possible, technically possible, to continue to make sure that we're as safe and secure as possible. Clint Malman, I know, difficult time, as I said, for you, certainly for your company, and I really appreciate you giving us this time today. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you to our customers, and especially to our employees that have just been amazing during this time. Now, a few hours after that interview, Clint Malman did more than thank his customers. He said sorry. He issued a letter that expressed sincere apologies for the inconvenience and any concerns that may have arisen from the cybersecurity incident. Well, next, a boy's reaction to hearing the sounds of his mother's voice. You can see he's got this cheeky little smile and his reaction, I would just burst into tears. A big milestone in our moment. That little guy is three-year-old Nate McKenna from Australia. He recently had a life-changing surgery. So Nate was, was born with some hearing loss, but with the help of cochlear implants, he was finally able to properly hear his parents. His moment is our moment. Nate, can you see mum? <laughs> did, 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 did. Hello. Hello. <laughs> His reaction, I would just burst into tears. I was so, so happy that it had worked. He took into mum. So Nate was born with hearing loss. They suggested that the um, we have hearing aids. We thought that it was going to be fine. I wonder what your name is. I wonder if you know. Nate! But then we did more testing and we realised even with wearing hearing aids, he wasn't detecting sounds and we were only able to get in for testing in January this year. There is a long waiting list. As a parent, um, there's a lot of emotions. He was probably like, oh, yes, I can hear again. You know, that's mum. You can see he's got this cheeky little smile. And yeah, he is very attached to me. So it's brilliant. I was just so happy for him. That cheeky little smile indeed. 
I'm going to guess it's not the first time you've seen an image of a little one hearing their parents' voice for the first time or maybe hearing it again. What unites all of those moments is that is that hint of recognition, that instant of recognition. It is beautiful. That's why we wanted to share it with you tonight. From all of us at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.